Well, did you like first thing or did you hate, hate the tension of it? I, I a lot do, of people say it's the worst thing in the world to do. And then it's the it. hardest job in the movie business. It's gotten easier with digital where you can actually get some feedback and see if it was sharp. Right. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it wasn't for me. <laughs> Through the lens here in the offices of Handheld Films, and we're very lucky today to have with us Mr. Peter Deming. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. What made you want to be a DP in the first place? Uh, just, I just really enjoyed it, and I thought if I could, you know, it wasn't like a job to me, was, and if I could do that and make a living, then it was better than, you know, working in a bank or something where you dreaded going to work every day. Right. A lot of photographers say, well, you know, um, you know, I, I don't want anything I do to look the same as the next thing because that right. would be that would be like me copying myself, right? Right. right. Yeah, let's go back to your influences. What was the thing you noticed in photography that you originally liked? Mm. You know, I think that I don't know. It's hard to sort of pick out one or two things. I mean, I came up sort of making Super Eight movies when I was yeah. a kid. Right. Also being a still photographer. Also sort of watching. You know, one of the first filmmakers who. I was sort of conscious of who was making this movie was Orson Welles. Right. So, um, you know, I sort of started looking at his films and just then just noticing, um, you know, photography related to story. Uh, aside from Citizen Kane, give us some of your other films. Uh, Touch of Evil. Touch of Evil, yeah. okay. I mean, it's sort of every film I prep, it's so I start with Touch of Evil. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. Every film. <laughs> It's like well, it's sort of—it's always in my head, you know. So, um, but it was really—it really comes from storytelling and how, like you say, you know, no two films should really look the same. You know, there's certain things that you gravitate towards because you, you know, you think they're effective or you they you find them pleasing or, or whatever that may you know reoccur from time to time right. in your work. So now, so you know, Hollywood Shuffle is a milestone for you. You're, you're, you, you get noticed in the business when it's released, at least for being a part with this. What, what was the thing that you think put you on the map? Well, I think you know that and Evil Dead Do came out right within a few couple months of each other. This is your first work with Sam Raimi? Yeah, and obviously two completely different movies. Yes, you know, one got a lot of sort of mainstream press. You know, Hollywood Shuffle, you know, it was like this sort of easy to promote story, filmmaking story. Yeah. And, you know, the film's quite funny. Winky Dinky Doll. Bobby, say it with me, come on. Winky Dinky Doll. Winky Dinky Doll. Yeah. Woo! Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I like that. Mm. Mr. Jones, it's not that I'm not happy working here, it's just that. Acting allows me to be creative. Bobby, you can create here. I created the Winky Dinky Doll. 100% beef. Winky Dinky Hamburger. Winky Dinky Donut. Winky Dinky Dip. And I got a new one, Bobby. The Winky Dinky Whole Cake. Whole Cake. Whole Cake. Holes got to eat too, right? Right, you're right. That's right. Whenever people look at your resume and, and They've actually heard of the film that you did. <laughs> it always helps, helps you yeah, know. Yeah, so yeah. that and you know, Sam's thing was a little more, a little more culty, you know, a little more cinematic, maybe. Right. Um, so you sort of cover a couple bases there right away. You get Evil Dead Two. You shoot Evil Dead Two, which is quite stylish. And what's what's the experience of working with Sam Raimi, who is one of the ultimate visual storytellers of our, of our generation. Right. Well, on that film, you know, we sort of gathered and at breakfast and went over the shots and Sam would draw little stick figures, you know, of frames and... But it was a little different for me because I came into that film two weeks into shooting. So, you know, uh -huh. I didn't really get any prep. So it was just sort of thrown into the mix and, you know... You're thinking... I was kind of thinking I'd light it like this does that sound good well no i mean we had we looked at what was shot you know uh -huh. we had conversations about yeah. the look that he was going for and you know during the first couple of weeks you sort of fine-tune that 
and it's more about um, it's a little bit more about the complexity of the shots that he's doing. You know, we uh, we shoot forward, we shoot backwards. Right. You know, rarely did we shoot 24 frames a second. Rarely. Yeah, I mean, the poor sound guy, you know, some days he wouldn't even roll anything because we're in a lot of 20 frames or 21, you know, it's all guy track of, you know, monsters grunting and <laughs> stuff they ultimately won't use but would help them in post. So, um, you know, and we didn't have, this was 86, so they didn't have the, the money or the technology to sort of reverse everything in post and, you know, right. so we did all that stuff was in camera. Wow. Party was probably. Yeah. How did you get that job? Um, I'm not really sure. You know, my, maybe some of it was Hollywood Shuffle. There's a scene in that movie, um, Kid and Play, right? Yeah. Kid, um, they each have a girl that they want to, you know, connect with. Mm -hmm. And I say connect with, not to be euphemistic. It's, like it's not just screw. It's actually they actually have crushes. And right. It's, very, it's actually quite a mature picture. And I remember in the review that Roger and Ebert gave. They said this is actually a touching movie. Right. Right? Anyway, he gets alone with her in a bedroom and they decide they're gonna have sex. Right. Look, Sydney, I ain't gonna lie. I'm attracted to both of you. But if I have to make a choice, and that seems to be what you're asking, then I gotta tell you, you're who I want as a friend. And I think if you go with someone, you should be friends as well as lovers. Yeah, okay. All right. uh. Uh. I, I guess it's been in here a little too long. And I just wanted it to feel like they could actually go through with this act. You know, and it wasn't like a sitcom situation, you know. Well, now, it's a beautiful scene. It was, it's, a, it's a beautiful, it's also, it's, a, it's kind of a, a movie people should take another look at. I think the, the only thing that's distracting about it now is that the styles, yeah. the, you know, the, the billowy shirts and everything. So, it's so, you know, dated, yeah. but maybe within a few more years, people will be able to look at it with that Well, in a few more years, lens. they'll probably be back to that style. So. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then it'll be cool it's again. It's true. You'll yeah. probably be wearing that. Uh, wearing not it. likely. <laughs> <laughs> look, I don't DJ for free anymore. Plus, you never provide transportation. You tell me how I'm supposed to get my turntables, records, and speakers over there anyway. Yo, man, I have the house keys, as well as the car keys. My parents, down south, way down south. We're in. Look, look let me rap, oh, and then we'll consider it. We should talk about my cousin Vinny a little bit. You know, when you're making this movie, I mean, obviously the title's My Cousin Vinny. I think everyone that went to the theater thought, Okay, because you know we're gonna we're gonna right right and then and and then you get in there and this thing just doesn't let you go it's right just like it right. grabs you doesn't let you go with the phenomenal performances all across the board. All right, Ma, listen, we gotta get an attorney and it's gonna cost a lot of money. How much would an attorney cost? A decent one, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars. Fifty, a hundred thousand. I know, Ma. I know. Don't we use any attorney. I think so. He says he thinks so. Oh, he is? Well, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. You think he'll do it? What? We got an attorney in the family. Great. Who? My cousin Vinny. How long have you been practicing? Almost six weeks. But... 
Man, you graduated from law school six years ago. What have you been doing since? Studying for the bar. Six years? Mm -hmm. It's a film that, like you say, was very well written. Yeah. And, you know, sort of cast to its strengths of the characters. I mean, you read that character of Vinny and, you know, Pesci's just perfect for it. You right. know, so much of that is him. Um, and Marissa, you know, I didn't, we didn't know much about Marissa. I think she just did a film uh, with John Landis at the time. Uh -huh. And um, so there's, you know, there's sort of no persona coming with her. So she had that advantage where she could become a character and no one had any preconceptions about her. Uh, but she pretty much, you know, nailed that one. Oh, yeah. I think. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I am. What are you nervous about? I'm the one that's under the gun here. The trial starts tomorrow. You want to know what I'm nervous about? I'll tell you what I'm nervous about. I am in the dark here with all this legal crap. I have no idea what's going on. All I know is you're screwing up and I can't help. You lent me a little camera, didn't you? Oh, Finny, I'm watching you go down in flames, and you're bringing me with you, and I can't do anything about it. And? Well, I hate to bring it up, because I know you got enough pressure on you already, but we agreed to get married as soon as you won your first case. Meanwhile, ten years later, my niece, the daughter of my sister, is getting married. My biological clock is ticking like this, and the way this case is going, I ain't never getting married. What was your biggest challenge on that movie, um, technically, creatively? Um, it's hard to say, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, compositionally it was challenging, you know. Uh, when your leading man is probably 5'1", 5'2", you right. know. Yeah, I remember one scene we had, uh, uh, it was Joe and uh, Fred Gwynn. Fred Gwynn's about seven foot, six eleven, seven feet tall, you Playing know, the, the judge. judge, he was the judge. And, yeah, what does he eat? And they had a walk and talk down a hallway. And, you know, <laughs> I sat down with Jonathan Lynn, the director, and I said, how are we going to do this? You know, it's like, it's going to have to be so wide, it's going to be not, you know, I don't know if it's going to play for the dialogue. Right. We ended up building, a, building up one side of the hallway for Joe that was uh, out of frame you know, shot in such a way where it still obviously had a big height difference, but it was manageable for that shot. So you actually had to build like a whole, a whole riser. Ramp, yeah. yeah. Is there any DP that walks into a courtroom and doesn't go, shit, how do I make this different? We actually built that. That was probably one of the first, first sort of studio builds that, you know, I had to deal with. And Unfortunately, it was in a warehouse. We didn't have, you know, as much space as we would have liked, both outside the set and above. Uh, in fact, when it rained, we had to stop because it was so loud. And certainly when I look at it now, I would do a lot of things differently. But it was, it's sort of balancing, you know, sort of the typical dramatic courtroom you would see, you know, and then sort of tempering that to fit in this movie, you know, for a comedy. And now your approach, working with Jonathan, your approach to framing, you know, are, are, you, are, you a, are you a wide lens guy, are you a long lens guy, you whatever, it suits the, the moment or the... Yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on the story, you know. He, he had a lot more experience in comedy than I did. And, you know, he believed in sort of letting the comedy happen, which I agree with, you know. But I think you still have to make it cinematic or it's too much like a three-camera TV show, you know. How do you go about selecting your scripts? Well, <laughs> it depends on where you are sort of in the career timeline. You know, at first you just do anything you can. Um, and then you sort of, I mean, I gravitate towards stories that I like, you know. Sometimes they're visual, sometimes they're not. You know, you can always make them more visual than they appear on paper. Uh, depending on, you know, who you're working with, who yeah. you're collaborating with. But, you know, so I, to me it, uh, it starts from either a funny story or a compelling story or a dramatic story, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, maybe there's set pieces within the script that you're interested in. You know, it sort of builds from there, right. you know. So let's talk a bit about... There's a lot I want to talk to you about, but uh, how does how does Lost Highway how does David Lynch come into your 
into your life. Okay. David called me, and he was doing a sort of an omnibus for HBO called Hotel Room. And he was directing two of the three episodes. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time I actually got to work with him. I always liken David to a painter, you know, as a filmmaker. Where yes. You have all the tools you need, and you sort of have an idea of what you want, but it, it doesn't become fully realized until the day of. And okay, in talking about that, you know, I've watched some extensive interviews with Mr. Lynch, and he said one time, I think, um, that mood is achieved through th three things: the way things are arranged in front of the camera, the lighting, mm -hmm. and sound. Now, obviously, when you're shooting, you don't know that he's going to be creating a rumble. I mean, the first time I played Mulholland Drive, I did it in a home theater that was. Where it well set up, and, and right. the rumble was so powerful that it was like the walls were were, right. were literally <laughs> crevicing. Right? You can't know that when you're shooting it. You don't. You know. No, I mean sometimes he'll mention things like that. You know, there were a couple scenes in Lost Highway that he had already picked out the music for, and really? when we were shooting those scenes, that music uh, was playing like definitely loud while you're rolling. The actors are are doing their thing, you know, yeah. and, uh... Can you give me an example of uh, that? One was, um, when Baltazar was in the... walking down the hallway of the Lost Highway Hotel. You had this, like, Rammstein, this German industrial music playing. Yeah. And we literally had a speaker, huge speaker, on the dolly. It was cranked all the way up as we're dollying down this hallway. Performance. It changed everyone. I mean, the dolly grip, everybody was feeding off this. You know, it was and, pretty and great. David is there? Well, he was probably at the end of the hallway with a megaphone, <laughs> trying to be heard. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, is there ever moments when you, I mean, you, you get to set, or you've read the script, and you read the script, and you know you're shooting whatever today, and you don't know how it, Mr. Lynch is going to want to do it, and then all of a sudden, when you see it, you go, oh. The very first day of On Lost Highway, there was yeah. a scene in this Patricia and Bill in the living room, and yeah. the dialogue's very like, uh, oh, hi, you know, I have to work tonight, you know, it's sort of... He's a musician. Yeah. He's suspicious of his Oh, wife. you're going to come down to the club? Not really. Well, none of that's in the, in the script. It's just the dialogue that you hear, and... It seems very cheery when you read it, you know, day interior, living room, you know, 50s suburban ranch house. Right. And this dialogue between a man and a wife, and so we sort of, you know, got there and got it going, sort of half lit, and then they rehearsed it. And then when we saw the scene, <laughs> I just turned, and I said, I'm going to need a little more time. And it was just, like you say, there was so much tension between those two people, and so much backstory in the exact lines that I had read in the script, nothing changed. Then I had to relight the scene much darker, much moodier. You don't mind that I'm not coming to the club tonight? What are you gonna do? Stay home, read. 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 Read what? <laughs> Everyone wants to explain David Lynch movies, and sometimes they need no explanation. They're beautiful text. They're you know whatever. And sometimes you can just, for the sake of argument, say, well, this is what it's it's is happening or whatever. And so right. From that perspective, Bill Pullman figures out his wife's cheating on him, and then does something, presumably kills her, and then creates this alternate reality idea in his head of him being Balthazar Getty where he's young and he's attractive and everyone wants him. I, I don't know if that's the way you saw the story or not, or the way David saw the story, but that's what I get out of it. Uh -huh. So that being said, in the period of the beginning of the movie where there's this tension growing, there seems to be like sort of like ships passing in the night between 
Pullman and his wife. Mm -hmm. And it gets darker and darker. And the, I remember very sparse furniture. There's a side table, mm -hmm. a very weird side table. That David made, yeah. David had that made. No, he made it himself. He's a very accomplished uh, carpenter. He's got a whole wood shop. He makes furniture all the time. <laughs> really? Yeah. Can I get him to make me a chair? Uh, it, yeah, it'd be real expensive. Be, wait, does pay. he charge for his furniture? Or? Uh, there was a company that was going to sort of produce it and sell it. I don't know if that ever happened. But I remember in the film, there's a little table at the top of the stairs that's like triangular. Uh, yeah. He definitely made that one. That's the one I'm and the, talking about. And I think the coffee table he may have made. I'm Which sure. is also bizarre. And then, But then you have put in, along with these weird angles and this house that becomes almost like a, like a entrapping in a way, mm -hmm. you put in these shafts of light. Mm -hmm. that start, it starts off a little bit lit and then it gets more and more and more shafty. Was that a conscious choice? A little bit. I mean, you just want to sort of show certain parts of the room, you know, and then you just let the shadows get deeper and deeper. And some of it was just the physicality of the house. I mean, you see in one shot where he comes out when he, you know, very early when he hears the front buzzer and he runs out and you're behind him and you see these little windows. Yeah. There's two little yep. windows and that's pretty much it. You know, and thankfully David put in a skylight or it would have been tough just to light it, you know, to see it. But those windows sort of allowed us to just pick up little parts of the room. How is the effect achieved at the, I mean, now first of all, when it goes to the Balthazar Getty story, when we transition also somewhere to a mechanic shop and there's, there's a mobster's wife, girlfriend, and right. all that stuff, it feels like there's kind of like a, kind of a, a time is a very, a glow over the story. Was that some kind of filtration, or was it... You mean when you go from the prison cell to the prison cell? Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. It was, um... It was a thing we started, um... Because we shot out a sequence. It was a thing we started, we were shooting a scene with, with Balthazar in his bedroom, uh, right before his friends come over. And, um... I think we, after that shot, we were changing lenses. We we're shooting with anamorphics, which are a little bigger than yep. most lenses. Yep. And, you know, the assistant was trying to put the lens in and kept getting stuck and kept pulling it out and putting it back in. And Dave was watching the monitor and fell in love with that effect. So we started doing that. You know, there's a shot in that scene where he's looking at the ceiling light and we're sort of moving up towards it at the same time the assistant's pulling the lens in and out of the camera. Um, while he's pulling focus, I don't know how he did it. Um, so we started doing that. Physically removing yeah. it. While the camera's rolling. So we started doing that uh, in Balthazar's section of the movie. So when it came to the, the transition, David just wanted to throw it way out of focus and it, it wouldn't go out of focus enough. So we ended up pulling the lens out a little bit, just holding it there for that effect in the in the sell because it was it just wasn't bokeh enough ish no it wasn't wow it wasn't soft enough <laughs> that's amazing this is really like taking the camera and beating it up to get what you want yeah um okay so at the end of the movie at the at the end of this of this wonderfully dark and haunting story we go back to bill pullman and uh he is now being chased by police officers. Mm -hmm. And there is a sequence of shots that's almost like um, if you and I are talking and you're, you're the nice guy that you are and then as you leave you turn to me and you punch me in the face five mm -hmm. times. Uh -huh. That's what it felt like, visually. It felt like, like being kicked in the face. Right. Almost that you as, a, as an audience member were guilty of not, not doing enough. Which we did once in the movie when he was being interrogated. Right. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's like I was mentioning earlier. I mean, you go out with the tools and you put them all together and then David just sort of orchestrates it. Right. You know, to what he feels at the moment, I think. Well, Lost Highway, one of the great... It was fun. That was yeah. fun. And I, don't, and I think, I think it, in years to come, well, let's talk about the ultimate movie that gets appreciated and then reappreciated and re-appreciated and starts to, like a fine wine, just keep on blossoming. 
Mulholland Drive. <laughs>